Love hemp makes 20 barrels of oil. Mm. No need for pesticides to poison all our soil. People got no food, they got no clothes, they got no rent. Thank you for taking Time for Hemp. I'm your host, Casper Leach. You are listening to Time for Hemp all around the world on Tumblr, SoundCloud, iTunes, iHeartRadio, anywhere you can hear sound. We are found. Please share us with your friends. You can also go to Time for Hemp.com and check out our archives. Every show has an archive page. And if you like that program, you can find all past segments on the Time for Hemp website and download all past programs from that host that you enjoy. And again, all MP3s are free, and you can share them with your friends. It is Wednesday on Time for Hemp, and on Wednesday, we put a spotlight on the amazing people at Leap Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, L-E-A-P dot C-C. I would encourage you to go there and find yourself a speaker to help bring to your neck of the woods someone who might help inform your community about the importance of ending prohibition. On the program today, we have a retired senior patrol officer from Hillard, Ohio, and uh, he spent 20 years or so in uniform. I'll let him tell his story. Uh, He arrested a young man one day, and it ruined his life, and he realized it. And that is, I think, his turning point from wearing a badge and arresting people and putting them behind bars to maybe finding a way to help them get their medication. I'll let him tell what it was that opened his eyes here on the big broadcast. His name is Tim Johnson. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, Casper. I want to thank you for taking time for him. And uh, uh, that's my understanding. You arrested somebody, and it ruined their life so much that you uh, just didn't want to be part of that type of destruction. Is that true? Uh, That's true. And let me start off with thank you for being a part of the Lee family and all you've done for us. And, uh, yes, very true. Uh, Early on in my career, um, just a quick introduction of myself. Yeah, I did spend 20 years in the uniform on the street. Some of that time was undercover. Uh, working with various federal to uh, local um, narcotic task force units, uh, along with other areas in law enforcement. Uh, a lot of time spent on the street, though. But early on in my career, yes, right after uh, finishing up my field training, uh, I encountered a young gentleman uh, sitting in a park, smoking a joint, enjoying himself. Uh, I made my approach, marked out on the radio where I was at, of course, my field training officer responds immediately to uh, check out how I operate and how I do the, you know, the protocols and so forth. Um, I did make an arrest on that young gentleman who was 19 years of age. I did charge him criminally for possession of marijuana. Uh, through the court case, the end result was he did receive a criminal conviction, even though Ohio has been a decriminalized state since 1977. He still received a criminal conviction with a criminal record, a six-month suspension on his driver's license. That, in turn, as a result of that, he also lost his school grants, a part-time job that he had with no transportation. Um, He had lost a part-time job as well, uh, dropped out of school. And uh, from there, I uh, had encountered him a few times, his a uh, few encounters with his family later on, uh, come to find out that it had kind of exacerbated his life on a downward slope, leading to uh, further criminal activity and into uh, other areas, I guess, of life that he probably or may not have won if that incident wouldn't have occurred. But I did, yes, uh, follow, do what I had to do at that time. It did have an impact on me after I seen the outcome the end results of what it had done and uh, where it had led a young man to go with his life as a result of that, realizing he was making his choice and I was make, doing my job. Uh, the final result, uh, based on, I guess, the stigma of society, the way that we had to treat it and so forth, uh, it gave me a whole different perspective, a whole different outlook on it, and 
for the rest of my career in law enforcement that it was uh, in the back of my mind. Now, did you feel like uh, helping the guy afterwards? I mean, because you helped ruin his life, did you like, or did you just stand back and watch and just have a change of mind? Well, I, I did give him guidance. I did speak with him several times. Uh, I was also, during my career, involved with uh, as a community liaison officer and spent um, 15 years in the uh, community policing um, organ- or community policing programs, working in the schools uh, with kids of all ages uh, from, with various uh, issues, uh, and uh, a lot of them being drugs. And I did try to, you know, I, I spoke with him, as I said, a few times in reference to the case, in reference to what had happened. Um, we did develop a decent relationship, I can say, after that, uh, once we had become to understand each other's viewpoints at the time. And um, it did create a lot of, uh, um, I'll say, positive impact on our relationship with as having an open communication with him whenever I had the uh, few times after that when I'd went to the house to see what the problem was, and he would sit and talk to me. Uh, it wasn't a violent kid. Uh, it's just the the impact, the toll that it took on him with the goals that he had in life, where he was headed. Uh, was in his sophomore year in college. He was doing real well for himself, and how this, he let this affect him and uh, the way that it affected me as well. Now, when you got involved in law enforcement, uh, I'm sure you got involved with the idea that you were going to help uh, track down killers and people who were beating up uh, uh, the defenseless. Uh, did, did the war on drugs kind of um, take away that uh, excitement of being a police officer? Well, the war on drugs, uh, when when an officer, when an individual, I guess, first gets into law enforcement from what I was, what I seen, and I became a field training officer myself, so I dealt with a lot of individuals. Um, putting on a badge and on your chest and a gun on your side gives you uh, this an personality with uh, an, an inflated ego that you're in control of all situations, and it is what you say. It's how things should go. With the war on drugs, uh, I looked at that when I got in there as I'm going to make an impact on this here. And once you get actually get involved in that segment of it, uh, you find out that you're really not making an impact. Uh, as statistics have showed us that, you know, the war on drugs was just uh, basically it's winning. Uh, law enforcement's not winning at this. We're actually, you know, we're losing lives, not only in the community, but we're losing law enforcement lives on a daily basis as a result of the war on drugs. Uh, so there are different approaches that are out there now, such as the LEAP organization on how to uh, deal with these things. And we are starting to see a larger percentage of law enforcement that are coming around and understanding, uh, especially cannabis being uh, marijuana being the number one uh, so street-associated drug that law enforcement uses to address the uh, war on drugs as an avenue to get to other drugs that are out there, illicit drugs or even pharmaceutical drugs, which seem to be a mainstream problem now. So, um, yeah, the impact of, you know, what I had on the war on drugs is very minute. Well, now I'm from Indiana, and I can also tell you that the laws uh, make it easier for the police to uh, f- make uh, different charges and to uh, come into homes for different reasons and, I mean, and the concept of medical marijuana, as an example, in my home state, Indiana, is just laughable. And I know where you're at in Ohio, your governor just signed a new law. But um, I still get the impression that uh, uh, when they hear marijuana, people still don't think medication. They still think stoners getting high, ha, 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 let's arrest them and put them away. Are the attitudes changing now, starting in the, in the Ohio, Indiana area? I think that's going to take a long time to to uh, change the stigma that society has towards uh, medical marijuana with it being beat into generations after generation. Um, the reefer madness, the uh, stoners, per, you know, attitude, uh, those types of um, uh, 
profiling, I can say, of individuals that used uh, cannabis or used marijuana, uh, they there there is a large percentage out there now that does understand, and they are starting to recognize because there is there's a preponderance of evidence on irrefutable medical, uh, scientifically proven medical cannabis, medical marijuana, uh, so to say, and. It's it's kind of hard to deny what is there now, and people are coming around. You still have your hardliners that don't want to change, that still look at it differently. But uh, the new House bill here in Ohio uh, that passed, uh, yeah, it's a House bill. It's it's an open door. It's a step in the right direction, though it is very limited and very biased. Um, by that I mean as far as it is limited and biased to the number and of ailments that it will address and the types of ailments that it will address and then the availability uh, as far as getting that medication. So uh, we are starting to see, I think Ohio was up in the 85 to 90 percent percentile of individuals that were for medical marijuana. It's the recreational use or personal use of it that people are still frowning on but we are slowly gaining on that. We're up into the 56 to 60 percent uh, uh, percentile of people that are starting to understand that, yeah, recreational or uh, you know, personal use of it is acceptable as well. So it's, it, as you said, being from Indiana and Ohio here in the Midwest Belt, uh, you know, we tend to be conservative. We're a little bit harder to change. Uh, but the change is coming. I don't expect it to happen overnight. Um, especially with what I'm seeing out there right now. Uh, it's, a, it's a continuing effort of advocating uh, activists, lobbying, uh, the whole thing, the whole gamut of it, you know, getting the politicians involved, uh, getting uh, professionals involved, not only from, you know, the law enforcement career field, that, uh, but, you know, the medical career field uh, and so forth, getting, just getting more avenues, getting more people involved, more professionals which it's very kind of hard, hard to do, especially in Ohio. And a uh, real quick example, in Ohio, the Attorney General, they control all licensures uh, and certifications in the state of Ohio. So in any career field from a barber up to a, a an attorney or something that has, you know, the, it's state certification, um, if they get involved with, it's an ethical violation to even get involved. Uh, it's, it's basically, you have no First Amendment rights to it. You can't even speak of it. Uh, I wasn't allowed to be a part of LEAP. I wasn't about allowed to be a part of NORMAL. I wasn't allowed to be a part of any association with anything that was uh, related to medic or related to marijuana as a whole. Uh, while I was still uh, at a commission, um, they can t you know pull your license right out right out from under. There goes your job. There goes your career and uh, your way of your living. So it's something you got to be real careful with here in the Midwest. Well, I also know that uh, you can, with the right amount of marijuana, you can get felony charges and spend like 20, 30 years behind bars. No, oh, definitely. Uh, I think Ohio, the uh, as far as incarcerations in Ohio, um, with the decrim, it's up to 100 grams, what they call the decrim. Uh, and a decrim is just basically, it's, it's a guideline statute of what, the courts being the judge, it's a guideline of what the judge can go by. It's not what the judge has to do. Uh, every statute is basically a guideline. The judge looks at those guidelines and the judge makes their decisions on what they're going to do. And just because they say it's a decrimmed guide, a decrimmed guidelines, decrimmed statute doesn't mean that's what the judge has to go by. The judge can render down whatever decision that he, he decides to. And then of course, juries kind of come out with their own verdicts as well. But yes, after, uh, um, I believe in Ohio, I think it's 200 grams. After that, it becomes a felony charge. And as it progresses on up, with, depending on your amounts, yes, you can get uh, up to, I think it's after 1,000 grams, or yeah, 1,000 grams in Ohio, which is how law enforcement always um, they kind of exploit their arrests by saying we got, you know, instead of saying we got two pounds of marijuana, you know, you add that up and you've got just almost a thousand grams. So, you know, we got 900 and so it's about 56 grams, whatever, or 856 grams, whatever, something there. They use that number of grams. So I believe it's a thousand grams and it becomes a felony five. 
and you can't be looking at like a three-year sentence off of just something like that. Um, so it's kind of like a, you know, in comparison to a loaf of bread, which weighs a pound, if you have a loaf of or a pound of uh, marijuana, you're going to get charged with a felony for the possession alone, you know, not to mention if it's broken down and they get you for distribution, they get you for cultivation if you're growing it uh, and get caught with that. Uh, there's a variety of ways that you can receive felony charges and, uh, um, yeah, long-term sentences for sure. It hasn't gone away and it hasn't decreased any. It's still there, contrary to a lot of people's popular beliefs that, um, you know, their misinterpretation of understanding the law on what it says, that you can do some time. Um, incarceration rates in Ohio are extremely high uh, as a result of not just drugs al- alone, but cannabis or marijuana is one of the main uh, factors there as far as people being incarcerated. Um, and it's because of the uh, supply and the demand for it on the streets. Uh, that's, you know, then there's the uh, glamorization of the money that's involved and people willing to take the risk and chance and, you know, better their lives possibly or to, you know, make that extra money, go out and have extra, you know, um, material things in life that they may not get, you know, with a minimum wage job or a low wage job. And so this is an opportunity they look at it. Many people do, but those that I've talked to over the years, sit and talk with them and, uh, you know, they'll, you treat them like a person, just as what they are. And, They'll tell you their stories. They'll tell you their lives. And that's where, along the road, I, I heard a lot of impressive stories and um, kind of influenced, you know, my output as I see things now. And when I look back and reflect on it and so on. But, yeah, you got to be careful here in the Midwest with uh, what you're going to, you know, as far as what you have in possession. Even with the uh, bills that are passing, it doesn't take away the criminal laws. The criminal laws are still there. And, and in all reality, the creation of the House bill here in Ohio, House Bill 523, we still have all the criminal laws are still there. And now we have additional um, medical marijuana laws that we have to deal with as well, too, that you have to comply with. So uh, they didn't get rid of any laws. They created more laws is what they've done. <laughs> yeah, that's what they say sometimes when it comes to marijuana legalization it's not really legalization it's ma- it's marijuana regulation <laughs> yeah yeah you could say that i always call it re-legalization of uh marijuana since you know it was legal clear up until 1937 when they made the first tax stamp act against it and then from there it went to 1972 when uh the actual so-called drug or war on drugs began with richard nixon um refusing to go with the uh, Pfeiffer Commission that went out and uh, did a study on marijuana, came back and says, no, there's no problems, there's no reasons that this should be made illegal. Uh, he went against this, his commission and uh, decided to, this is how he was going to address certain ethnicities, certain neighborhoods, and uh, control, um, you know, start the war on drugs with some other countries and that's what they did. They, they implemented a bunch of uh, laws at that time, and we are where we are today. We've, yeah, we're more than half of our states have become re-legalized in various fashions, from you know recreational to medical use of it. But really, all they've done is created uh, the criminal laws. Never went away, as I said. They've created more laws by passing bills. Now they have the medical marijuana bills or laws that you have to abide by. And so it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a catch 22 either way you, you look at it or go about it. Yeah. Jack Hare and I used to say that they will re-legalize marijuana as soon as they figure out how to get their finger into that pie and get most of the cash. Then, then they'll make it legal until then they're going to fight to arrest us. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's about the truth of it. There. And, um, why they don't, why, uh, I guess the big question that I have and a lot of other people have is first off is why does the DEA control, um, something that's in the, of this, in the medical, it should be controlled by the FDA, I guess I should say. And, uh, but the DEA has basically total or control over uh, what's going to happen with it. 
Um, I think a lot of the law enforcement mentality as uh, agencies is the, the amount of money that's involved that they can seize, and it goes into their uh, drugs uh, seizure um, fund. And they, you know, the part of that, the percentage of it, the department involved gets to keep it. And that money grows and grows, and then they can use it for departmental, in both as departmental funds for uh, equipment and for schooling and for supplies, uh, things that have, you know, they've, they've got a guideline they have to go by of what it can and can't be used for. But it does create a lot of revenue, and it does subsidize a lot of departments' uh, budgets. But well, there's a lot of money out there, but involved with it. Um, personally, I believe if the government actually looked into it and realized that what these states that are legalizing, re-legalizing it, the amount of money that's coming in from taxes of how much money can be made from this uh, as another, you know, medication on the shelf. Uh, just by going across the board, all 50 states at a federal level and taking it out of the Schedule 1 into a Schedule Three to a schedule five and well, controlling uh, it. So, some of the sad thing is that the police departments are lining their pockets and putting that money into their departments to fund uh, their departments, as you said. But how they're getting that money, in all honesty, is through legal theft. These people are out there earning that money. They are doing a job for that money. Many people invest their whole life into having a drug trade, a marijuana trade. But because it's considered illegal, you can go in there and overtake. You can take more than just the money that they earn from it. You can take their house, their car, everything through civil forfeiture. And as a police right. department, just sit on it. And then they have to prove that the material that you took from them was not gained illegally. So instead of charging the person, you're charging the property. And by charging the property, that makes it possible for them uh, to, for the police departments to take every penny out of the bank account, every piece of uh, furniture out of the house, take the cars and seize them, and then turn around and sell it, auction it off, and then fund the department. So in all honesty, in a lot of times it seems like that those funds are people's hard labor. Those people, that money comes from people's, uh, their, their whole life savings. And uh, department police departments are stealing that money uh, with a um, uh, the war on drugs, making it legal to do so, and uh, using it to buy tanks, guns, and bullets. Now, am I misperceiving that? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think uh, you, you feel the way a lot of society is starting to feel. Uh, under you know, civil asset forfeiture laws, and the laws do make it easy for law enforcement of, uh, to uh, recover um, monetary things, recover property, or material things, um, personal property from people and things without justification, so to say, as for does the time fit the cr or crime or a crime fit the time, either way you want to look at it. It's not right. It's uh, very simple. The American mentality is, is that we don't walk around with cash in our pockets unless we're up to no good. So in a simple traffic stop, I could give an example here. I was, you know, I worked with some canine units, actually a couple of really good ones here in our state. And um, it was very simple for them to just make a traffic stop and get an odor of marijuana find one joint in the vehicle and the individual might have ten, twenty thousand dollars in cash in their pocket. Are they allowed to have that? Yes, they are. There's no law against carrying the cash in your pocket, but as a result of that one joint that was found, um, that officer can go ahead and confiscate that money and put it in to the case and request through the courts that uh, you know, we're requesting to seize it because we believe that, you know, through the report that I write up I'm going to be very creative in my narrative that it is highly possible that money was going to be used to purchase more drugs and to be distributed. And typically for the average person that that may be their personal money or their personal money. And, you know, for them to pay the legal fees to try to fight the courts to get that back, um, it's going to cost them more than what they're getting back in most cases. 
So again, they're in a catch twenty two position where, you know, that ten twenty thousand dollars, you know, is it? You know, I want my money back, but the courts aren't going to give it back to me because the police say this that it's being used for criminal activity, and of course, typically the courts believe the police, and also the courts are getting a percentage of that money themselves. It, that's brought in because the police department don't get to keep it all. They get a percentage, the courts get a percentage, and then the uh, good old wonderful DEA gets a percentage of it, even though they weren't even involved in the incident. But that's the way the game works. So, um, And everybody yeah. feels better about it because they use the word recover. We're recovering funds. We're recovering money from the illegal trade. When in all honesty, it's not recovering money from the illegal trade. It's outright stealing money out of people's pockets who worked hard for that, and that's their whole life savings. Well, you know, Casper, that word got me in trouble a lot of times with supervisors was recovering when they said, well, we we are recovering the money. And I would say, well, I didn't realize that there was a report filed on it, that it was lost. Right. And uh, so I said, no, you're not recovering it. You're taking it because... The law is written in a way that it permits you to take it, and now it automatically places the burden upon the individual that is supposed to be assumed innocent. He's automat- that person is automatically guilty, and because they have that much money on them, they, were- they are up to no good. They're out to do some, some type of drug trading, so law enforcement and the courts are going to take it. So at that point, now I'm not. I mean, I'm just playing devil's advocate. At that point, doesn't the police departments who are involved with that actually end up being thieves? Um, I guess that's a matter of perception. Uh, a lot of people feel that way. And a lot of people look at it that way. Uh, I'm not going to defend. Uh, I guess that I'm not going to defend that statement from a law enforcement perspective. I still have the utmost respect for law enforcement because there is a definite need for it. But, uh, yeah, I guess you could say, in essence, uh, is it legal thievery? Uh, You've got a very good valid point that would be hard for um, anyone in their right mind to try to uh, defend that and or, you know, and say that that's not the truth. Because originally those laws were written for really good concepts is how they got in there. They never would have been written, you know, to get people like, oh, my God, Al Capone, who's got like millions of dollars and never filed taxes, right? Okay. And then they're turned around and they're used on everyday people who are just trying to make ends meet. And you and I both know people, uh, like the gentleman that you arrested. He lost his student loan. Anything he would have had, he it would have been taken from him. He wouldn't have even been able to make payments on his student loans. If he would have had money in an account, it would have been taken from him. And uh, hardworking people are losing their, like, secondhand cars that they use to get their kids to school or um, – you know, whatever, a few dollars they've got in the bank account. And it, and it's pretty sad now the way these – and people – and we, you and I both read in the news um, about uh, roadblocks in various states where the people are doing what you were just talking about. They used to pull a car over, find large sums of cash in somebody's wallet that they legitimately have right to. And um, it's, it's quite a game, isn't it? It's most definitely a game out there. Uh, and especially for young law enforcement, when they first get involved, uh, it's it's what they go after. And a lot of times it's um, based off of administrative pressure. Uh, they have what they call, well, they're not allowed to call them quotas. They call them uh, standard performances. It's evaluations. Uh, it's, a, it's the same thing either way you look at it. You know, you you want the officer out there to be productive. But there's other ways to be productive in society than to going after the simplest thing. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, uh, just to give a rough example, you know, it's easier to get a single playing baseball than it is to get a home run. So, you know, go get as many singles as you can. Uh, m- mentality for, you know, young officers, go out there and make all the arrests you can. Uh, traffic stops are a given. Uh, you know, you can basically stop eight, nine out of ten cars moving on the roadway if you follow them for 60 seconds. So... It's, and at that point there, once the traffic stopped, you know, the officers are trained and they're trained very well with communication skills as far as extracting information or even visual um, observation of something that's laying openly out in the vehicle and so forth, the plain view doctrine. 
So they do, yeah, it is, you know, go out there and get it, uh, get the recommendation at the end of the month on your uh, tally sheet to show what you've been doing, what your productivity, uh, et cetera, and it goes on and on. Because so. even Neil Franklin, who's, uh, I think, currently uh, uh, in charge of LEAP, when he was yeah. in the department, uh, he's a, he's a, I think you've met Neil. He's a, uh, a former member, uh, of the police department, black member of the police department. And we talked about profiling and how, uh, they would pick certain neighborhoods to even go out and do their arrest. Cause you know, he'd point out, well, you can find people who are smoking marijuana and doing crack in the poverty section of town, or you can find them in the upper class section of town. Now, when you make the arrest, in the poverty section of town, all you have is a bunch of broke people and some secondhand cars. But when you go and make the arrest in the well-to-do parts of town, you certainly have a nice bounty to take back to the police department with you, along with the uh, perpetrators. <laughs> yeah, that, that, it's very true. There, there is a uh, uh, ethnicity, you know, racial profiling does definitely play into the role of the war on drugs uh, it plays into the social economic status of the neighborhoods. Uh, typically, um, higher to dense, or, you know, the higher the density of a neighborhood, the easier it is to go into those neighborhoods and find things. Uh, and so, rather than to go into a suburb neighborhood or out into the country where there's not as many homes, there's not as much activity, so to say. However, there, you know. Um, don't be misguided or misled to thinking that there's nothing going on in the suburbs or there's nothing going on, you know, in these mansions and stuff. Well, typically there is, it, it's there. Uh, it's just that those, a lot of those people uh, are what have a, are a little bit financial, more financially stable. They're able to um, go into courtrooms to hire pro- high profile attorneys to pay to pay to play. We can call it, right? And um, you know, you don't see them uh, sitting around as much. You don't see them losing uh, their driver's license, possibly, They're losing their job. You know, they have, they're able to get some counseling, so it makes the courts happier. Whatever they pay smaller fines, and down the road they go. You know, and they continue on. Um, you get into your smaller uh, neighborhoods, uh, those social economically deprived neighborhoods, and those people don't have. And uh, the two hundred dollars they might have in their pocket, that might be their, you know, part of their weekly paycheck. And you catch them with a joint, and you have the, you know, legal right by the way the law law's written to take that two hundred dollars from them, and say that okay, you know, you're out here doing something with it. And so. Um, the laws basically say, you know, we're not allowed to carry cash with us anymore. If you do, you know, you call with any kind of drug on you, we're going to take the dr- the drugs and the uh, cash from you. So and we see that happening in those um, tight knit socially deprived neighborhoods. And, uh, um, you know, those people, they do. They lose their cars. They lose their jobs. They lose driving privileges. Um, as a result of that, uh, you know, you start running into problems within the family and, Things kind of escalate. You know, they can't get to the meetings that they're supposed to go to that they're court-ordered to. They can't afford to pay all their fines. As a result, they, you know, warrants start building up on top of warrants. And it's just, it's a big, es- you know, escalator of demise is what ends up happening. And that's also going to be frustrating, too, for officers who've gone in to protect the community from real crime. that they get tripped up in this, like, this game almost. Right. Yeah, it is. It, it, it wears on you after a while, uh, and especially if you ever have, you know, not all officers get the opportunity to to put on plain clothes and to go undercover, to get into neighborhoods like that and to see what's really going on. They don't have that opportunity. Uh, or once you actually get in there, um, you know, it's it's not all glory like Miami Vice and some of these other uh, I'm kind of aging myself there, but you know it's not all glory like uh, you know what the TV or whatever makes it out to be. Um, you actually see people's lives being ruined, and uh, you see people harming themselves. Uh, you, you see a lot of destruction, you know, family breakdowns, um, uh, loss of you know parents uh, because someone's being incarcerated as a result of not being able. To, as if, so to say, if they had, you know, a, a good paying job, 
uh, were able to uh, buy their way out of it with a couple of treatments here and there and then continue on with their career or something. So uh, it does wear on you after a while when you uh, continually see that type of thing happening. And uh, the children, especially um, how it affects them when they're, you know, really not even a part of it, but they do become the major part of it. Because I've been lucky enough to have known a few officers before they became officers, meaning I had the opportunity to know what their intentions were before they put on the uniform. And each of them were wanting to help the community, you know, and you know, and being better, you know, stop murderers and people who were robbing and beating, right? You know, the horrible, the horrible crimes. And it seemed like over the years, as I maintained my friendship with these people, that they became disillusioned with their work because of the war on drugs. And they found themselves sitting in court doing paperwork for a judge and, and testifying about somebody having less than a, a pound of plant. And then the people who are raping and beating that they do arrest, they don't have time to work with and they get less time behind bars. And after about five or seven years of wearing the uniform, they're very frustrated, and it's all, again, because of this war on drugs. Yeah, that, that's very true. And I believe for most officers, you know, there's always that question on the application. It says, why do you want to be a law enforcement officer? And I'm going to say 90-some percent of the people probably answer that with, uh, you know, I want to protect and serve. Uh, the problem with that is, is that what does protect and serve mean to you? They don't ask that additional question. So once the officers get wrapped up in the whole gamut of this, you know, they go through all their training, uh, and, and it's intense training. It's, you know, it's varies by state and so forth, but uh, it's it's an intense training and, and somewhat a, um, I don't know if it's fair to call it brainwashing or a cult or whatever, but, you know, it is what it is. Uh, you know, you're um, programmed into a job that this, these are the guidelines, the rules, the procedures that you will follow. Uh, you do give up certain uh, constitutional rights of your own as a result, uh, you know, civil rights and so forth of, of your own as a result of now raising your hand and swearing yourself into office, you know. So um, that does play a major role in it from, that's my perception, it's what I've seen. And especially as a field training officer, I've seen a variety of you know ethnicities and both genders come in. Um, I've seen a lot of the guys from the Middle East, uh, you know, war that have come back and want to maintain carrying a firearm, and they've got this mentality that I, you know, I guess de uh, de um, sensitize them as far as. Um, you know, you're not in the military anymore. You're not in a war zone anymore. This is a community of people out here that are just like you. And I would explain to them what, you know, protect and serve means. And it doesn't mean to take the war on drugs and let that be the only aspect of law enforcement that you address. And unfortunately, the major I believe that the majority of law enforcement is focused on the war on drugs. And instead of you know, protecting and serving the communities from the more violent crimes that are um, against people. We're out here, you know, addressing issues that it's called, they use the frame drug of, or the, the, you know, the, the um, drug of abuse. Uh, for, if you're using that as a drug of abuse, you know, it's an individual abusing, doing something to themselves. Let's address it that way. If we go out and, you know, slice our wrists, try to harm ourselves, you know, um, whatever physical way it might be, we don't, get, we don't arrest people for that. We try to get them help. So why can't we treat uh, drugs in that same manner if people are doing that? You know, we need to, law enforcement needs to be focusing more on, you know, the more violent crimes, the robberies, the rapes, the burglaries, the thefts where it's, you know, person-on-person -person type thing rather than just an individual doing something to themselves. I would also like to think that uh, it becomes painfully obvious to uh, members of the law enforcement community that uh, the war on drugs actually funds the quote-unquote enemy and makes it possible for them to buy bullets and guns. And because of that, uh, members who are wearing the shield are more in danger <laughs> 
Whereas if they had it regulated, there'd be no black market. And without the black market, your enemy couldn't afford to be buying weapons to weaponize. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's very true too, Casper. That you know, uh, the war on drugs has escalated. It has provided a very good fi- or avenue of uh, finances for the underground market and for the various cartels, from the street gangs to the individual. Uh, people that are growing to set grow rooms in their homes or in their barns or wherever it might be on their personal property and they just have a handful of friends they're selling it to, as I say, clear up through cartel organizations, um, you know, that are making billions of dollars off of it and it's all because of, you know, supply and demand and it not being regulated or controlled. And I think you're seeing that in the states that are re-legalizing it that, there is a percentage and rather a large percentage of the black market fading away because uh, the controlled market now, that's, we'll call it, is, uh, is kind of, taken over. They're producing a better product. They're producing a, probably a safer product. They're able to find out what the underground market prices are, and they're undercutting those. So it, it is. It's harming them. And why the top brass, uh, the top politicians, you know, from federal to local governments, why they're not seeing this and why they're not understanding it or why they're not willing to just give into it and recognize that is, and that's, it baffles me. And it's one of the things that I have testified on here in Ohio, um, very, uh, you know, in depth with the politicians here about, uh, I understand you guys are wanting, you're trying to do something good for the state and for the people. And I want medication off of this plant for, you know, from the children to the adults, to anyone in between, to anybody that needs it. But at the same time, you, you have an opportunity here to control this. And you're not going to control it by only, you know, if, if you've got 100 problems and you're only going to address 20 of those problems, you're not doing any control. You're, you know, you're exacerbating the issue. And that's, uh, you know, how I look at it. That's what they're doing. Well, that and, you know, like you and I just had that discussion and came to, what you know, that realization, right? And here they are with committees and groups of people and researchers at their fingertips to give them these same stats. And I don't know, I've always, you know, tried to be clever when it comes to working with my opposition. And I figure, well, the quickest way to get rid of my opposition is to watch it go broke. Hello? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, exactly. That's the way to do it. And, you know, we, we, uh, uh, there was groups of us in Ohio that we did educate, um, a, what was called a task force committee and then a representative committee and then a Senate committee. And, uh, you know, we did a lot, of, we brought in a lot of uh, very knowledgeable, um, people, you know, during these hearings that, that we had. Um, you know, and I'm talking, you know, well to do people that were very highly educated that have done research all over the world and with me- uh medical marijuana, um and opened their eyes up to, you know, how long this has been going on. We educated them on the history of medical marijuana, that you know, how it was even in the pharmacopoeia from eighteen forty five uh, or eighteen fifty, I believe it was, clear up until like nineteen forty two. Uh, it was, you know, the, we were already using it. We were already studying it. And then we ran into a couple of little gauntlets here. And so ever since then, now all we've done is, you know, like you said, you know, if you want to uh, bankrupt someone, you, you know, you take their source of that or their avenue of, you know, making money away from them and it'll bankrupt them. And, you know, if these people that are in charge, if they would just look at it that way, if they would address the issues that way, I think we would see a whole different uh, ball game out there. Well, and, and a safer one at that. I think it would be in such a way that <laughs> and the, the war on drugs would not be uh, so much bullets as it would end up being, oh, I don't know, rock sticks running. <laughs> right. It could be. Uh, and you're, you're exactly right there. there you know, and one of the hardest parts with the war on drugs is um, the loss of life. Uh, needless loss of life, and it's just not, you know, minuscule. It's it's in the masses. Um, uh, you know, let's be realistic here and talk about domestic terrorism. And uh, you know, people are worried. You know, I, I dealt with terrorism myself back in the mid seventies with the uh, Irish Republican Army when I was in the military. 
Um, I was uh, on a uh, terrorist uh, task force back then, and it, people in America didn't understand until uh, 9-11 what terrorism really was. And now every little thing happens. Uh, they They still stay away from domestic terrorism, which happens every day on the streets. And every now and then we'll get a, uh, uh, an actual, what they call terrorism event, because based off of the background, ethnicity or race of the person that committed that act. And, um, so we see that happening there. Uh, a lot of lives needlessly being lost on a daily basis. We see law enforcement, uh, losing their lives on a daily basis as a result of this. Uh, believe me, I kicked enough doors or I was the first one into the door that, you know, didn't know if I was going to come back out of that door or not. Uh, so, you know, I've been there and done that. And I guess that's why I can speak about it. And, uh, you know, thankfully, you know, I'm sitting here where I am today, retired and uh, doing what I am doing now to hopefully, um, you know, make some changes and educate some people and, uh, work with Leap as much as I can and uh, turning some uh, viewpoints around and continuing my uh, efforts uh, down at, the, at our state house and with all the you know politicians and civic leaders that I can and um, you know it's not nothing that we expect to happen overnight but you know it, it hasn't we've been fighting it for a long time and you know we're we're gonna it's gonna continue so there's active things going on now to to, to make changes and we'll see where we go and what happens and hopefully you know in the generations uh like myself after i'm gone there'll be people to generations to follow to do the same thing until you know it is fully totally decriminalized as i've always said it should be you know if you're going to have regular if you're going to do something let's regulate it and put it under civil law rather than criminal law and let's you know take the war out of it well, and, and now you and you and I both know from dealing with this, you don't have to have a, a, the IQ of a genius to understand what we're saying. You don't have to be able to understand how to do brain surgery or or, or the uh, how a, the molecular structure of a cell is is designed. I mean, this is just common sense by looking, standing back and looking at the big picture and all the things that we talk about with the war on drugs and why it should end and why it doesn't make sense to fund the enemy and why it's uh, destroying so many lives. With all that said, you would think that people in the Midwest, and I'm from Indiana, so I can say this, <laughs> you think the people from the Midwest would get it. But Tim, you and I both know people in the Midwest, they're just so hardcore. Drugs are bad. We're going to get them all off the street. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> right. Very true. Uh, and you know the, as you said, the, you know the Midwest. That's how we are. I think a lot of times we speak and we say what we don't really mean. We, what we do, about the majority of the time, what we speak is what society wants us to speak, um, because we're f- afraid of the retaliation or what uh, the repercussions to if we are stand up for ourselves and actually uh, speak the truth and say you know what we want to say which is what I have found out myself since my retirement that, that, you know, now I'm not obligated to the badge or to those specific guidelines, procedures and policies anymore. I can speak the truth. I can, uh, you know, and it's not, I'm not speaking ill will of law enforcement at all or trying to bad mouth any of it, but it's, it's the pre- procedures, it's the policies, it's the laws that are created. Um, it's just the way things are set up and, uh, as in general, you know, you just you can become an outcast socially if uh, you're in any kind of a social organization, and you know, you, you know you bring up marijuana, and the people look at you and they're just like, oh my God, no, this, you know, when half the people that are probably in the organization are at home going home at night and enjoying can you know marijuana themselves. No, and you're right because it's not like people in the Midwest are stupid. But yeah, you're right. You know, I've heard people say people in the Midwest are so nice compared to New York. It's like, no, New Yorkers are just honest. They just tell you to your face, we don't like you, you're rude, get out of here. Uh, people in the Midwest are two-faced. Like you said, they're really nice to you. They'll say what you want to hear. But then right. when they get home, they're totally different. <laughs> that's that's very true, yeah. I, I know uh, uh, I've, I've talked before about, you know, uh, 
different, you know, I've done several talks when I was still working uh, in the law enforcement and people, well, what kind of people, uh, you know, what does a drug dealer look like? What does a drug user look like? And I go, and I, my typical comment, I goes, well, they're from janitors to judges. And, um, you know, people were like, no, 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 that's not what we're told. I goes, well, what you're told is the problem. You're not told the truth. You're told what basically the government wants you to believe, what they want you to perceive, or what right. someone else, an organization, wants from you. They right. don't want you. So, I mean, and that's where a lot of people get their opinions from on things, and that's what they go with. In the meantime, you know, you got a civic association with, 10 members and seven of those 10 members actually will just smoke marijuana and they're all going to go home after that meeting on Monday night and smoke marijuana, seven of the 10 of them. But inside that meeting, you can't say that you do. Otherwise you become an immediate outcast. Yeah. And that's another thing too. When I lived in Indiana, I had what I call a straight job, you know, working as a cashier or whatever. And uh, everybody, my customers and my employers knew I was involved with the marijuana movement, trying to end prohibition. But for gosh sake, dare I even say the word marijuana? If I, if I was just standing in line as a customer at another store sometimes, I'd just say, you know, something's like marijuana. I mean, people would just like stop and look at me like I had just said something horrible. Right. Right. That's exactly the perception that people have in general out there. Um, just simply to bring that up and, you know, I mean, it's, it's in the news every day. It seems like, and, you know, something that's happened and they always relate it back to marijuana. You have you know, every year at the beginning of the school year, at the end of the school year, you have a, a young teenager that wrecks a car and, you know, one, two, three, four kids are killed. And of course they do a, uh, blood test, uh, you know, on the driver and there's a trace of, uh, THC and, uh, you know, they don't, you know, that's what the whole thing's about. All of a sudden it's about marijuana and they make sure they definitely, the media gets a hold of that and they exploit it. And they, you know, that's what, that's what caused the accident. Uh, has nothing to do with, you know, the fifth of alcohol that was in the car or the, you know, six kids in the car that's built for four. Right. <laughs> have a radio blasting, and they're all, you know, joking around and teasing each other, and they're driving 90 mile an hour in a 50 mile an hour zone, and nobody's paying attention, not even the driver, and, it's, you know, the accident occurs, but it comes back down to that, uh, well, they got a reading of THC in the driver's body. And so... Well, this has really been a great hour. I can't believe how fast it's gone by. I didn't even stop for breaks in it. So this is going to be a special hour without any breaks on the Time for Hemp broadcast. We are down to the last two minutes of the broadcast. This gives you a chance to put a spotlight on any organization like Leap maybe or uh, any f website that you want to put a spotlight on and let people know about. Well, since I'm working with LEAP, um, uh, yeah, I definitely put a spotlight on law enforcement against prohibition. And they can be reached at uh, com, as well as info at leap.cc or www.leap.cc. And go online. Uh, you can join up as a general member if you're in the judicial branch um, anywhere from uh, corrections officers to attorneys, law enforcement, judges, prosecutors, the whole gamut. You can join in as that. Under that uh, category, military people can join under military status and uh, become a part of a, a large organization that is now, I believe, in over 20 different countries and somewhere around 180,000 uh, membership. So. Wow, I tell you, I remember when Leap was just about 12 people. <laughs> yes, well, Neil has got out there and knocked on a few doors. He has He's done a great. fantastic job. He's great. And I want to remind people that we are a team here at the Time for Hemp Global Broadcasting Network. Used to be just little old me making a lot of noise in the wind for an hour every day. And now we got 20 people who are making a whole lot of noise all around the world on Tumblr, SoundCloud, iTunes, iHeartRadio. And, of course, we're on the Roku TV network as well. Anywhere there's sound found on the Internet, we're found around the Internet. 
And, of course, I always tell people, time for hemp is like a good joint. It's always best when you share us with your friends. Look at all that money, yeah, the money that they spend. Take another look and spend some time for 